Isn't that what we need? Isn't, don't we need to see Christ? Uh, don't we need our hearts to be prepared? Friends, we have uh, ushers up front, and if you need an outline to follow our sermon today, they will provide you with one if you just raise your hand. We need our hearts to be prepared for the preaching of the word. All the eloquence that I don't have will not plant the seed of God's word deep down in your hearts unless God moves. Thank you, Ben, for leading us into that song. Let me ask you a question. Are you humble? Are you a humble person? It's a tricky question, isn't it? Because if you say no, then, well, we've got work to do. If you say yes, that means you're not. We've got work to do, right? So, so, so the question really at the end of the day is, are you aware that you need to be humbled or do you need to become aware of that? That is the question at the end of the day. I have a friend that humorously says that he's working on writing his first book, Humility, and how I've achieved it. I don't think, he's, I don't think he understood it. But friends, we are confronted often, often in life with our, our desire to be prideful, but life reminds us that we don't have anything to boast on, right? And we have been spending time in the book of, of James, and, and that has been really helpful because time and time again, James reminds us that true Christianity is expressed through works, right? Works are not the foundation of our salvation, but, but works show evidence that we have indeed been, uh, been saved. And, and today, today we're going to consider the test of humility in how we speak to one another within the context of the local church. Before we do that, let's, let's just let's think about what we have already seen and what we already know about the book of James. If you're a visitor with us and you're thinking, uh, is it, why are you speaking about humility and speech? Are there problems in the church that need to be addressed? And the answer is yes and no, right? Uh, no, we're not addressing this because we, we see some special problem that needs to be addressed at this very moment. God has given us much grace and you, we are a very unified church. But these are the kind of things that you come across when you preach expositionally, exegetically through the Bible. You come across issues that sometimes work as vaccines, right, to, 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 to heal the disease, but, but, I'm sorry, as antidotes to heal a disease, but sometimes they work as vaccines to prevent the disease. So, so this is, in a sense, in a sense, a sermon that is to prevent, to prevent evil speech to create roots in our church. So the letter, uh, the letter of James is uh, written by James, the, the half-brother of Jesus. Um, by the way, James did not believe in Jesus until after his resurrection. We see in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appears to James, specifically. But James came to faith, came to trust in Christ, and was later, became later the pastor of the first church, the church in Jerusalem. We see his leadership throughout the book of Acts, in the book of Galatians, and, uh, and, and he was the leader in that church. The letter of James is the first letter to Jewish Christians and churches spread around the Mediterranean world. Pastor James was already concerned about faulty faith 
from cultural Christianity. And you may say, wait a second, I thought cultural Christianity was a modern term. It's something that's happening today, right? We, we know that uh, usually the first generation that hears the gospel loves the gospel. The second generation puts up with the gospel. The third generation rejects the gospel. That's often what happens, right, as the gospel is coming to new cultures. Um, but as James points out to us, cultural Christianity is not a modern thing, but it's the natural inclination of our hearts, right? We're naturally going to look at God's word and, and, and desire or try or attempt to take away authority from it because it confronts us, doesn't it? Pastor James calls out people for being religious but not godly, right? As, as if you can be truly religious but not godly. He was very concerned about ingenuous salvation. People who say that they're Christians, but they live like the world lives. Listen, if the gospel has not changed you, it has not saved you. If the gospel does not change how you act, that is an evidence that he has not created roots in your hearts. And Pastor James is concerned about that. Pastor James is not focusing on theological knowledge, but on godly behavior. We can put it in a different way. We can put it like this. Pastor James is not concerned with the theoretical aspects of theology, but rather he's concerned with theology applied. How do we live out the theology that we know? So throughout the Bible, we see this push for godly living. We see 50 imperatives plus, 50 plus. The, the text that we're going to see today is guided by one of these imperatives. An imperative is a verb that comes at you and tells you to do something, right? It, it sounds like the word emperor, so it's the emperor's verb. The emperor told us to do this, so we ought to do it. But we also see that throughout the book of uh, James, uh, we see the similarity with the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So it's kind of like our wisdom literature of the New Testament. Very similar to the book of Proverbs. Pastor James explodes the relationship between faith and works. We are saved by faith alone, right? That's one of the big pillars of the Reformation. Praise God for the Reformation. We are saved by faith alone, but Faith that saves is never alone. Save, saving faith will demonstrate that it is true by the works. Right? And then finally, Pastor James gives several tests to help you determine if you are a true Christian. That is a really important question. We ought to be asking ourselves that question are we truly Christians? Well, that is what Pastor James confronts us with. Let us examine our hearts and let us see if we truly belong to the faith. The test of faith for a Christian is not the day you raise your hand and walk down an aisle. Though you might have been saved at that moment. But the test of faith for a Christian is, are you at this moment trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, for your hope of eternal, lives, of eternal life. And is that changing your life? Do we belong to the faith? So last week, Pastor Ben challenged us to live in true humility. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And this week, we're going to see humility applied to how we should speak to one another in the context of the local church. Really, really, this passage that we're going to consider, which is going to be James 4, 11 and 12, two verses, is really a, a passage that attaches itself as a practical application to Pastor Ben's sermon last week. The, the passage that we're considering today as well closes what James primarily has to say 
about the tongue and about how we ought to control the tongue. The tongue can build and the tongue can destroy. The tongue can be used for godly, purpose, godly purposes or the tongue can be used for demonic purposes. One time, it's probably 19 or 20, I was volunteering at a VBS and I was taking care of the kids and it came time for us to go outside and play American football. And by that, I mean the football that you play with your hands. I'm playing with, with kids, 12 and 13 year olds, and I'm thinking, man, I didn't grow up playing this sport, but they're just kids. I'm going to own this game. These kids are going to play to my game. But in the middle of the game, I hear one of these kids screaming, mind you, I'm 19, right? Scream, don't pass the ball to the bald man. <laughs> so immediately I start looking around. <laughs> let me spot the bald man. Who is this bald man? And let me make sure I don't pass the ball to him. And then I realize I'm the, only one, I'm the only man playing. The rest of them are kids. And then for the first time, I realize that people are actually calling me bald. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I don't know what I was most offended by, whether I was offended because they didn't want to pass the ball to me or that they called me bald. But all I know is that I still remember that kid, okay? <laughs> I still remember that kid very vividly. Oh, his tongue pierced through my heart. And it humbled me. It really did. Friends, God often causes us to go through humbling situations so that we can be reminded, reminded of who we really are and who He really is. We ought to be reminded often of the reality of humanity and the reality of God. Did you know that the Bible never tells us be careful so that you don't think too highly, too lowly of yourselves? The Bible never tells us that. On the contrary, the Bible tells us don't think too highly of yourselves. Think of yourselves in an adequate way. And that is why Life is such a humbling experience. So today we arrive at our text, and for the sake of context, I am going to go ahead and read James 4, 1 through 12. But we're only going to be considering verses 11 and 12. You have the, the full passage right there in front of you. Once you flip the page, you're going, to be, you're going to only see verses 11 and 12. So once you flip the page, you only need to flip it once. So let us consider... God's word. By the way, these are the most important words you're going to hear today. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirits that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. 
Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Verse 11. Do not speak against evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray. Father, we need you to speak to us. I pray that you give me the humility to not say anything that is not in accordance with your word is saying right now. And Father, I pray that you give my brothers and sisters here today the humility to hear it and to heed. Father, I pray that Sheridan Hills will be known as a church where evil speech creates no roots and where our words are used to build one another, edify one another, and to glorify you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So the passage that we're considering today, we're going to see four things in this passage, and that's going to be my outline. The first thing, the first thing that we're going to see is we're going to see a command. We're going to see our imperative verb that guides and dictates the whole passage. And then we're going to see two reasons to heed the command. And then finally, we're going to see a restatement of the opening command. So the first thing that we hear, and that's the beginning of verse 11, says this, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. So we are called to use our words like Christ would use his words wisely to build up. Now we hear this, and, and it's important for us to consider what speaking evil against one another does not mean, right? It, it, doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that we do not speak the truth, right? We, we know that God values truth. We know that we are sanctified in the truth, right? When Jesus prays for his disciple, he prays, he says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. Jesus is true himself. This does not mean we do not confront our brothers when they are in sin, right? This, this does not mean we, we speak things, even hard things, when they need to be said. We just heard James call, the, call his readers adulterous people, it could not possibly mean that we don't speak even hard things to turn people from sin. It doesn't even mean we don't advise a brother when, when he's being unwise, right? We ought to, we ought to use our words and use them even when they're strong when we are correcting and helping a brother. Now, do not speak evil against one another. I think it means to not speak in a proud way. It means speak in a humble way to one another. Yes, speak the truth. Yes, speak what is right. Yes, correct, admonish. But, but do it not from a proud predisposition, but a, a humble predisposition, right? James here is emphasizing humility in speech. He's emphasizing manner rather than content. He's not, he's not saying, he's not saying don't speak the truth. He's assuming that the truth ought to be sp spoken, but he's saying, when the truth is spoken among you, it ought, to be, it ought to be filled with humility. Remember, 
this passage flows out of the call to humility that Pastor Ben preached on last week. Saying the truth the wrong way is still wrong, right? For Christians, love and truth are a couple that cannot be separated. God is true, and God is love. And for God, those two things are not incompatible, right? We prize, we prize people who are sincere, and that is great, but let our sincerity be seasoned, be seasoned with love. Colossians 4, 6 says this, let your speech always be gracious, filled with grace, seasoned with salt. I think this means winsome. Our speech ought to be attractive so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We ought to speak in a gracious way even when we're speaking the truth, even when the truth is hard. James is emphasizing manner rather than contents, but he's also, he's also doing something else. I see something else in this, in this clause here. James is, prom- James is promoting unity within the local church. Where, where do I see that? Well, there are two things. First of all, he said, do not speak evil against one another, right? So, so there's a context there. Uh, it's a relational, right, admonishment that he's giving. Do not do this. Do not speak evil against one another. And then he puts this word here. Uh, he says, brothers. Whenever the, bro- whenever the Bible talks about brothers, the Bible is referring to fellow believers. Um, in these two verses, the word brothers appear three times. So James is really emphasizing the relationship among believers. Friends, our churches must be environments where evil speech finds no fertile ground. Have you ever looked outside on the grass? It happens here at the church all the time. After it rains a little bit, we start seeing all these wild mushrooms growing everywhere, right? And those mushrooms are good for nothing, right? You can't eat those, right? So, so they grow, and they're like weed. What do we have to do for those mushrooms to grow? Nothing. They just grow, right? In our sinfulness, in our hearts that are bent towards sin, evil speech grow like wild mushrooms. If we don't do anything, that is our default. If we don't pursue what is right, by default, we'll do what is wrong. If God doesn't intervene in our hearts and teach us to keep his commands, we'll by nature develop in this church an environment filled with evil speech towards one another. So I'm saying this so that you remember, by nature, we drift. I started by saying, no, this passage is not, we're not preaching this passage because there's a particular problem in our church with the tongue. I'm, we're preaching this passage because we got to remember, don't boast on that. But rely on God's grace so that in our church, an environment of kind and truthful speech may be fostered. Have you spoken evil against somebody in this room? Is there someone, is there someone whom you have spoken about and you did it so that you would look good regardless of how that person looked? H- have you loved yourself more than your neighbor? Have you loved yourself more than God? If you're, if you're, if you're saying yes, don't despair, right? Go to that person and ask for the person's forgiveness. Pray to God and ask God to remove the desire to speak evil from your heart. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, 
that it may give grace to those who hear it. So Paul is saying, Paul is saying, don't be this way. Instead, be that way. This passage in Ephesians 4 is, is a passage that Paul talks about putting off the old self and putting on the new self. Christian change is not just a conformity to certain behaviors, but it is a transformation of behaviors empowered, enabled by the work of the Holy Spirit. We're called to put off evil speech, and we're called instead to put on speech that builds up and speech that gives grace. Husbands, are you harsh with your wives? Do you speak to your wives in a harsh way? God is calling you to, instead of speaking to your wife in a harsh way, He is calling you to only use words that will build up your wife, that will give her grace. Wives, are you, are you, do you nag your husbands? Do you? Is, uh, do you speak in a way that you exacerbate your husbands? God is calling you to speak in a patient and selfless manner. God is not just calling you to stop it. God is calling you to replace it by the Holy Spirit. And we can see this list of put, on, put off and put on. We can see it with so many things. We can see it with pride, right? Pride is so deeply ingrained in us. Even if we conquer all things and we achieve humility, we'll be proud of the fact that we're humble. So God is telling us, put off pride, put on humility. Put off anxiety. So many times we speak out of anxiety. Instead, what do you put on? Put on faith. Trust God. Pray. Put off selfishness. So many times we speak out of selfishness. Put on service. You know, we're, we're part of this church. And did you know that the service of the church is not the job of the pastors alone? It's not the job of the staff alone. We are called to this church as pastors to enable the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, my job here, Pastor Ben's job, Pastor Andrew's job, Pastor Fred's job, is to enable you to do what you are called to do. But you may say, I don't even know where to begin. Well, I have a solution for you. Did you know we have a great children's ministry in this church? And did you know that God is calling many of you to volunteer your time to serve the children in this church, right? God is calling you to give up of your time so that parents, parents that have little children can sit here and learn God's word. God is calling you to do that. Pastor Lucas, what do I do then? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a very lovely lady over here in the nursery. Her name is Gladys. This very day, if God is telling you, you ought to serve the church, go over to Miss Gladys and tell Miss Gladys, Miss Gladys, I would like to serve. Give her your name. Give her your phone number. And she will enable you to do the work of ministry. And in doing so, instead of selfishness, we're going to be able to carry one another's burdens. And in doing so, in doing so, we'll be able to, this is Galatians 6, 2, we'll be able to fulfill the law of Christ. Love one another. So friends, let us be known, not as a church that's filled with pride, not as a church that's filled with anxiety or selfishness, but empowered by the Spirit, let us, let us be a church that's filled with service, that's filled with sacrifice. May people walk by our door and say, hey, I heard the people in this church really love each other. They don't just say it. They act on it.
We often talk about meaningful membership, but meaningful membership has more to do with what we do than with what we say. Let's leave it out. So now, James gives us the command to not to speak evil against one another. And then he follows it up with two reasons. And we're going to see that in the second half of verse 11 and the first half of verse 12. The first reason that James gives us for not speaking evil to one another is because we're all under the same law. We're all in the same boat together. Right? In God's kingdom, we only find many sinners and one Savior. There are two categories. So, if you're not the Savior, which you're not, you're a sinner. I don't say that lightly. But I say that because we need to be aware of that because that's what promotes humility. So if you're not the Savior, you are a sinner redeemed by grace. Where is room for pride in that? Where do we boast but on the cross? Isn't that true? Understanding the gospel promotes humility in the local church. After Peter goes and preaches to the, to, to, to the Roman centurion in Acts 10, he says this, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. In other words, God views we all the same way, loves us, and redeems us. In the local church, we are all equally sinners, and we're all equally saved. This is why, this is why in the local church, you don't come to confess your sins to me so that God will forgive them, right? I'm not a priest, right? We, we, we believe that we, we, we can confess our sins to one another for accountability purposes, but only God can forgive. So we go to Him through Christ, through Christ, enabled by the Spirit. This is why the pastors of this church, yes, lead the church, but also submit to the membership of the church. We are all accountable to the same God. There's not two classes of Christians. The Bible doesn't talk about that. The Bible talks about one shepherd, and that is Jesus. There's some complicated language here in this in the sentence. So what does it mean? What does this sentence mean? What does it mean to judge a brother? Do you see that he's using the speak evil against a brother and judge a brother interchangeably? He says, the one who speaks against a brother judges his brother, right? So... Um, that, that's, that's, that's the same concept. Speaks evil against the law. Well, what does that mean? And then here's what's even more puzzling. Judges the law. How can we judge the law? Well, I think, I think this is absurd. And I think that that's the point that James is trying to get across. He's saying... It's absurd for you to think that you are a judge of the law of God. He's saying, therefore, it's absurd for you to think that you can speak to your brother in a proud manner. I think, I don't think here James has in mind the Old Testament Mosaic law. I think what James has in mind here is what in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 8, he calls the royal law. And what is the royal law? It is to love your neighbor as yourself. In the passage, I think in the background of James' mind, there is Leviticus 19, 16 through 18. And it says this, You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. Here is, it's referring to the people of Israel, right? In the New Testament, since we're found in Christ, who is the, the true Israel, we now are the Israel of God. So I think that that's how it applies to us. 
do not speak, do not go around as a slanderer among your people. We can, we can think here, do not do that in the church. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. Then he signs, I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your hearts, but you shall reason frankly with your brother, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge, grudge against the son of your own people. In other words, don't be opposed to your brother. Instead, what should we do? But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Signed, I am the Lord. The royal law of Christ is what James is calling us to hear. When we speak evil against our brothers, in other words, when we judge our brothers, when our pride is so big that we view ourselves as superior to our brothers, we are, we are judging the law of Christ, which calls us to love our brothers as we love ourselves. If we judge the law actually disobey the law. Look at what it says. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law. In other words, in other words, we're disobedient when we look at the law and we say, huh, who cares about that? I am not going to be kind to my brother. You're breaking the law, and when we break the law, we go against God. If we judge the law, we actually try to take the place of God instead of submit ourselves, instead of submitting ourselves to Him. You are not a doer of the law, but you are a judge. But who is the judge of the law? Who judges? Is it not God who judges? Is it not God who has the authority to judge? God tells us to obey the law, not to judge the law. God tells us to love our neighbors. We don't do that with anything else in life, do we? Nobody, nobody gets stopped by a cop, and the cop goes up to you and tells you, sir, you're going 70 miles an hour, and the speed limit here was 35. Well, officer, to me, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. It doesn't matter what you say. That's ridiculous. You might get an extra citation for being disrespectful. Nobody lives that way. Nobody goes to the doctor and says, Sir, you, you're, you're ill. You need, to, you need to take these medicaments, these medicines. Well, doctor, that's what you think. I disagree with you. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I'm just going home and I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, that's foolish, isn't it? Let us, not, let us not be foolish. Nobody receives a letter from the IRS and says, taxes, who cares about taxes? I'm not going to pay my taxes. We don't do that. Why do we do that with the law of God? Why do we look at the law of God and disregard it? Look, God told the stars, be set in place and shine. Do what stars do. And what do the stars do? They obey. God tells the sun to rise every day. What does the sun do? What does the sun do? What does the sun do? That's <laughs> what you get when you get a Brazilian pastor in your church. The sun obeys, does it not? God tells the rain to fall, the rain falls. But God tells us, obey me, and we say no. Why? Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? We don't live as though the laws of this country or of this world don't apply to us. We ought to not live as though the laws of God don't apply to us. When we do, we act like Satan. 
Didn't Satan judge God's law? Did Satan not say to Eve, did God really say? Did God really say you die if you ate of this fruit? Satan placed himself above the law of God as a judge. And for that reason, he was condemned. Friends, by nature, we do the same thing. We ought to look at the law of God and not disregard it. We ought to obey it. Are there things in God's word that you are willingly disobeying? Are you coming to church every Sunday, but you are, are you living with your girlfriend? You know that the word of God calls that fornication. You ought to get married. Or you ought to get out of this relationship. Are you being dishonest at work? Are, are there things that you have to do at your job to advance your agenda and to please your boss? Let me tell you that it's more important to please God with honesty than to please your boss. Are you lacking in self-control? Are you constantly angry in a sinful manner? Are your children afraid of you because of how you speak or because you are too harsh? God's word tells us, fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Are you struggling with modesty? Do you think that people will only look at you and will only consider you if you dress in a certain way? At the root of every sin, there is lack of faith. Lack of faith is the, is the root that we can trace where every sin comes from. We, we don't believe that God's design of marriage is good, so therefore, we pursue sex outside of marriage. We, we don't believe that God, that God has already given us everything that we need and He is our provider, so we become dishonest at work because we want to handle the situation our own way, but not God's way. We, we don't believe that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, that God will give it to us, that God has given it to us and will enable us to walk in a controlled manner. So, therefore, we get angry and we sin and we commit murder with our words, even towards those whom we love. We, we don't believe that we were made in God's image and therefore, and therefore, there was no mistake in the way we were made. So we don't need, we don't need to attract people through sexuality outside of marriage. We don't trust that. So therefore, we dress in immodest ways. But friends, the good news is that faith is a gift. If you lack faith, if you lack faith, ask God, and he'll give you faith. You, you may be trusting in Jesus Christ, but, but you need to grow in faith so that you grow into being more like him, into resembling him more, into living more like Christ. Pray to God that he will give you faith so that you will live godly lives so that you won't be proud but humble and will indeed love your neighbor. So you consider the first reason that we're all under the same law. Now let's consider the second reason. Here's the second reason why we should not speak evil against our brothers. It is because God is the only one who judges justly. Listen to Proverbs 21.2. It says this, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. 
We could even be thinking that we're doing the right thing, but we shouldn't trust our eyes. But the Lord weighs the heart. Why shouldn't we judge our brothers? Because we don't know their hearts. Why should we not speak evil against our brothers? Because we are way too swayed by appearances. But God, God knows the heart. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. God establishes his law and judges according to it. We're going to consider two somewhat significant Old Testament passages now. And I think that they will be helpful. God is the one who establishes his law. He made it. He owns it. He does whatever he wants with it. Because he's righteous, then we know that he is a good judge. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, is a passage that we often consider when we're in, in Advent season. It's a, it's a messianic passage about the coming of Jesus. And it talks about Jesus as, as a judge and as a ruler. Here's what it says. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. So uh, uh, the, line, the, the line of the Jewish kings. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You see all these things, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, all these things that we lack, right? We lack wisdom, that's why we ask for it, right? We don't know all things. Gosh, I'm often reading the Bible and realizing, was this there? I, gosh, how long have I been a Christian for? We, we don't know, we don't understand, we don't have wisdom, we don't walk according to the spirits perfectly, right? But this, this, the, the shoot that's coming from the stump of Jesse, that is Jesus, is filled with these things. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Not only is he filled with these things, he truly loves the Lord. He shall not judge, now listen, he shall not judge by what he sees. We judge by what we see. But Jesus knows the hearts of men. Or decide disputes by what he hears, by, by, by his, what his ears hear. But with righteousness, we're not righteous. We are the unrighteous. We can only become righteous when we're vested with the righteousness of Christ. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. He is dressed with righteousness and faithfulness. We still need to put off right, our sinful nature and put on godliness. But Jesus is perfectly righteous, and he's perfectly faithful. Therefore, therefore, he can judge rightly. So many times in the Gospels we see, but Jesus knew their thoughts. But Jesus knew what, in, what was in their hearts. God establishes the law and judges according to it. But also we see in this passage that since there is only one Lord given, one, one judge, he who is able to save and destroy we see that through God's law, God is able to save and to destroy. A parallel passage here in Matthew 10, 28 says this. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Right? Do, do not fear men. Right? Fear of men is a big problem. Fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. 
Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Huh. That, those are harsh words. Who spoke that? Is that an Old Testament saying? No, those are Jesus' words. The word destroy here means can be eternally condemned, right? Eternal condemnation, right? God is able through his judgments, through his law, to judge and bring about either salvation or destruction. God is glorified either way. God is glorified in everything that happens in the world. God is glorified when he condemns rightly a sinner for his sins and when he justifies the unrighteous through the death of his son. God is glorified either way. So friends, let us glorify God by trusting in Christ and spare ourselves from the wrath to come. Now let's consider a, another passage from the Old Testament. And we're going to see a setting of, of judgment, a courthouse. This is the picture of a courthouse from the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. And, and let us see here, let us see here how God, the righteous judge, uses his power as a judge to save. Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 says this. Then he showed me, that is Zechariah, Joshua, the high priest. This is not Joshua from the book of Joshua, right? Joshua is a common name in the Bible um, in, among, the, among the Israelites. Uh, and, and in the time of Zechariah, there was a high priest called Joshua. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. So you see Joshua is standing. The angel of the Lord is there with him, right? Kind of standing side, side by side with him. And then we see who is persecuting him. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. By the way, Satan is the adversary. Satan is our enemy. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? So we see the angel of the Lord, who is now referred as merely the Lord, Yahweh, rebuking Satan by saying, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Verse 3. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. Now that's a big problem because if you ever read the Old Testament, you know that the priests had to have pristine garments. And, and, and if the, the priest's garments were not clean, he could not present a sacrifice for the people. He could not present a sacrifice for God to forgive the sins of the people. So really, really, Joshua, the high priest here, is standing with filthy garments representing the whole people of God. So it's as though we're all standing there and we're all standing with our filthy hands and with no arguments to present to God. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Huh. The angel of the Lord is interceding, but not only is the angel of the Lord interceding, he's providing, providing the clean garments. He is providing the righteousness. And I, Zechariah said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing 
Notice that God could have used his words to destroy Joshua, but instead, instead, the angel of the Lord interceded for him, and the Lord showed him mercy. Friends, we all, we all stand before the throne of God with our filthy garments. Joshua didn't say a word. There was no arguments. There is no other argument. There is no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. His only hope is that someone would intercede for him and give him the clean garments. We stand before God and our only hope is not the words from our mouth. Our only hope is not the good that we have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Our hope so that the righteous judge will not destroy us is not found within ourselves. We need an alien righteousness. A righteousness that comes from the outside. A righteousness that can only be found in Christ. Because... Though he was tempted in every way, he did not sin. And Jesus died on the cross, obeying the Father. But not only that, he died on the cross, taking on, the, on himself the full wrath of God. Why was God so angry? Because of our sins. Because he created us, gave us everything we need. But we said, God, thanks, but no thanks. We do not want to obey you. We do not want to honor you. But Jesus died, and through his death, he paid for our sins. And it is through Jesus' death that we can be reconciled with God. So if I were to ask you the question, why, would, why should God accept you into his heaven? If anything that you have done would come out of your lips would indicate that you have not understood what Christ has done for you. But if you just say, because Jesus died and paid for my sins, friends, we're reconciled with God. No longer should we fear God, but we should love him. We're soon going to be singing the song, and the song says this, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, right? Is Satan right to tell us of the guilt within? Yes, yes, we do have guilt within, but what do, I, what do we do? Upwards we look and see him there. What did he do? Who made an end to all my sins. Because the sinless Savior died, look at the exchange. Because the, the, the spotless sinner, the, the, the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul was counted free. For God, the just, the righteous judge, was satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Finally, we get to the reinstatement of the commandments. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Answer, I am nobody. I am nothing. I have no rights. We all stand condemned. But we can be justified by Christ. Humility promotes wisdom, and wisdom promotes unity. We ought to be characterized by humility. There is a, there is a, a quote that's attributed to Martin Luther in his deathbed. And Martin Luther, he was told, look, there's a movement of men who are starting to call themselves Luther Lutherans. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that great? People are starting to identify with you. Identify with you. And here's what Martin Luther said to that. It's not important. But we are just mere beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. That's all. We're not giving out the bread. We found it. And we're just telling people, come, come, taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So friends, as we conclude today, let us consider the example of Jesus. 
Isaiah 53, 7 says this, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb there is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And because he opened not his mouth, he was crucified. And because he was crucified, we may have peace with God. Would you pray with me?